What sort of things are space and time? Are they fundamental entities, irreducible and irreplaceable in our physics? Or do they emerge from or are otherwise dependent on other elements of nature? These are the questions that we're asking this week, and we have perhaps the best person in the world to answer them. Julian Barber is a physicist who spent over six decades thinking about these topics. He's written three books, The Discovery of Dynamics, The End of Time, and The Janus Point. Following the tradition of Leibniz and Mach, Julian's position goes something like this. Space is not a container that exists independently of the objects that it encloses. Rather, it is just a codification of geometric relationships between objects. Similarly, time does not exist independently of change. It cannot flow without things happening. Rather, time is a codification of the, the way that the world changes its shape from now to now, from one moment to the next. More recently, Julian has gone on to explore why there is an arrow to time, despite the symmetry of the fundamental physical laws. He gives a very different explanation for this than the one that's usually invoked in terms of entropy. Instead, Julian looks at a new quantity, the complexity, uh, and I think it's really interesting to think about what that quantity means and apply it in different ways. So look out for that. I've been hoping to speak to Julian um, for decades now, and it's really wonderful to have that opportunity. The only thing I regret is that we do run out of that very elusive thing, time. I'm James Robinson, and this is Multiverses. Julian Barlett, thank you so much for, for joining me. I want to take us back about 300 or so years to a, a debate which I think has greatly influenced your work between Newton and Leibniz. And I guess Newton think or thought that he had figured out the, the nature of time and space based on what he discovered um, from his dynamical equations. But what did Newton believe about space and time? He he believed that well he's in his famous Principia published in uh, 1687, he says that time is absolute and it flows independently of anything else in the universe, anything external, uh, like I suppose some river flowing on forever. Um now Newton Newton knew perfectly well that there were various things that measured time and that they, so to speak, marched in step so that you could have confidence in them. So first of all, there's the sidereal time, which is goes back to the rotation of the Earth relative to the stars. But then he knew that um, a few years before he published the Principia, the astronomer Royal Flamsteed at Greenwich had confirmed that the recently invented pendulum clocks keep the same time as the rotation of the Earth. Uh, but they don't keep, uh, neither the rotation of the Earth nor the pendulum clocks keep time with um, solar time because the sun doesn't move around the ecliptic uniformly. So he was, he was aware of that. He also, uh, and what he could have said, uh, which is basically what I say, and in a recent book, uh, Frank Vilcek, the Nobel Prize winner, has said that uh, the, the striking thing about the universe is that there are many processes which you can use as clocks, and they all march in step with each other. And in fact, um, that's how time is determined. Uh, UTC, the, 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 the time standard for the whole world, really goes back to... A, over a hundred, I think it is in total, atomic clocks. And it's their average that counts, not, not any one individual one, because each individual clock has hitches, it it, it, it glitches. Mm. Um, and so that, that underlies that principle. So basically, Newton knew that, but I don't know quite why he went for absolute time. He could just have said, well, there are processes in the universe which, which give us a good time. He says it may well be that there is no um, 
process, no motion in the universe, which does give perfect time. He, he does say that. Of course, the what he drew attention to was only a, approximate agreement because it's always experimental. I think his ideal for time was just he wanted to have something that was perfect and mathematical. He, he's very keen on on he wants to match the uh, marvelous accuracy of Euclidean geometry. He he wants to be as good as 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 a top class geometer, and and he makes that quite clear in his Principia. Um, so that's what he has to say about time. Uh, about space, we know much more about why he 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 said what he did about absolute space, uh, because that was uncovered in an unpublished paper of Newton uh, called uh, it, the opening words are de gravitazione, um, and that includes a very detailed discussion by Newton on Descartes' ideas about motion. So, so Descartes had introduced the um, idea that uh, uh, of the mechanical notion of, of, of physics, that, that the world is made up of material objects, which are sort of all bumping into each other because they're in a plenum, uh, a plenum. Uh, and uh, Descartes originally then, Descartes was the first person to formulate laws of nature, uh, of, of motion of these objects. And his his first two laws, uh, the first law was actually any piece of matter that is in motion will keep that the speed it has forever until it bumps into something else. And secondly, if it's not bumping into anything else, it will go in a straight line. And this just presupposes that's exactly Newton's first law and it presupposes Newton's ideas of absolute space and time and this was this was uh, 50 years before Newton published his Principia um, and Descartes was just about to publish his whole idea in a book called The World, Le Monde, in 1632 uh, when he heard about Galileo's um, being condemned by the Inquisition. Now, uh, this was a real problem for Descartes because he had accept, uh, he, he accepted the Copernican principle that the Earth goes round the sun, and moreover, that there are other suns uh, around which planets go. And uh, Giordano Bruno had been yeah. executed in 1600 for espousing those ideas, among others, I think. Um, and Galileo had been uh, put under house arrest in 1632. So Galileo, Descartes didn't want that fate. So he suppressed his book and thought hard what he could do. And then um, 12 years later, he published his magnum opus, The uh, Principles of Philosophy. And in the principles of philosophy, it starts with something which was not at all present in Le Monde. It, it starts with a lengthy discussion of motion. And he has two notions of what position and motion are. He says the position of an, of an object is determined by the thing that's immediately surrounding it. So if I'm wearing a glove, uh, my position is the glove or the position of my left hand is my right hand, or of my right hand, it's my left hand. Um, so, uh, so that actually goes right back to Aristotle, that idea. Then he said there was a second possibility for defining motion. That was the motion of anybody in the universe relative to all the other infinitely many bodies in the universe. And in both of those cases, he was safe from condemnation from the... Uh, Inquisition, because if it's because he assumed that the Earth was being carried round the Sun by a vortex, and the position of the Earth was defined by the vortex in which it's sitting, it, the Sun, it, the Earth is not moving relative to the vortex in which it, immediately mm -hmm. adjacent to it. So the Earth is not moving by that definition of motion, and also given that there are infinitely many bodies in the universe all moving in different ways, there's, there's no way there's a definite motion for the Earth to define. So one way or the other, he was safe. 
And but, but then having done all that, uh, he he then announces his laws of motion, uh, which are completely unchanged from uh, from Le Monde and presuppose absolute space and time. Mm. Now, when Newton read this sometime about, it's unknown when Newton read it, but later than 1668 and certainly some years before he published the Principia, he just said, this man is nuts. He's crazy. What's his, uh, uh, how on earth can he talk about straight lines in, 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 in this thing where he's just defined uh, motion in that way? Um, and then very significantly, I think, uh, he he introduces what since then has been called the notion of equilocality. So equilocality, as it was defined by the German relativist Jürgen Ehlers, and I think it's a very good word, means if, a, if everything is moving relative to each other, how can you say at this moment of time that this particular mm. point is the same point that it was at an earlier instant of time. And uh, Newton formulates that quite clearly in his De Gravitatione and says it's impossible because that earlier instant of time no longer exists. It's mm. impossible to identify in this instant of time what was a, which point was a previous point. Um, and that is clearly why that combined with this desire to rival the exactitude <laughs> or exactness, perhaps I should say, of geometry is why he wanted to introduce absolute space uh, so that he can talk about straight lines because he, he was well aware of the value of the law of inertia, which was already sort of floating around. Galileo had pretty well said it and, and, and so forth. Um, so that was really why he did it. But then when he came to publish the Principia, there's a famous scolium at the start of it where he lays out these definitions of absolute space and time and justifies them. Now, what very few people have realized is that it, when he wrote that scolium, he had two aims in mind. One was a very serious one, which was the problem of defining motion if everything is moving relative to each other. That's a, and, and to justify the introduce, introduction of absolute space. But the other one was to make a fool of that Frenchman Descartes, <laughs> who he saw as his great rival for his, you know, to establish his name in posterity. So a sort of, and he doesn't mention Descartes, he doesn't openly disagree with Descartes in that Principia, but he's clearly got him in his sights and there's all sorts of evidence for that. Um, and that had, uh, we can perhaps go on to that, but it had rather a positive uh, side effect. Um, well, we might, I might as well just mention it. So in the, in the Prince in the Scolium in the Principia, Newton has his famous bucket experiment where yeah. he imagines. Uh, and now, in the bucket experiment, he starts off with a bucket hanging from the ceiling uh, by a rope, which has been twisted round. The bucket is full of water, and the level of the water is the water level is level. And then he lets the, the bucket loose so that it can start spinning as the rope un unwinds. And as it does so, the water, the, the motion of the bucket is transmitted to the water and bit by bit, the water rises up the sides of the bucket. Uh, and when it's reached the maximum height it does, there's no motion between the water and the wall of the bucket. So he says this, this shows that this centrifugal force, this tendency from the center, is in no way due to relative motion. It must be due to motion relative to absolute space. Well, when Mach read that 200 years later, or nearly 200 years later, um, and quite unaware of the Cartesian background with, with, with Descartes, he just said, well, that's ridiculous to think the thin walls of the, thin walls of the bucket could do that. 
nobody can say what would happen if the walls of the bucket were thicker and thicker until they were ultimately several leagues thick. And I think that must have been, I, I haven't managed to check it out. I haven't got around to trying to look at everything that they, uh, Einstein read about it. But I'm pretty certain that remark of Mach was what made this idea of relative motion so plausible to, to Einstein. And so I think we may well uh, owe general relativity <laughs> to... <laughs> Descartes trying to escape the, the, the problems with the Inquisition. Um, but it's whether that's true or not, it doesn't matter. But it, it's a pleasant thought, I think. Uh, yeah. but, uh, but it does, I would say it is a serious thing because Mach himself said it is very important to study the history of science, how it develops, because when you do that, you see that a lot of science which now appears to be indubitably true and cannot be challenged is actually contingent and to a large extent accidental. So I think we might say that the discovery of general relativity is accidental. And I would say this has affected the form that it takes because I think, although I don't think there's any evidence to challenge the um, physical predictions that follow from general relativity, I do think the form in which it's represented may well be hindering uh, further discoveries, in particular clarifying whether there is any quantum gravity, and if so, what form it should take. Because um, a critical part of the development of general relativity was the introduction of the notion of uh, space-time by Minkowski. And Minkowski, if you read Minkowski's paper from 1908, there isn't a trace of Leibnizian or Machian yeah. intuition by it. So, um, so I would say so. And in general relativity, as Einstein formulated, he said it's it, it must be that locally space-time is, is Minkowskian. Uh, mm -hmm. uh, it, it, space and time are knit together in that way. So I would say that that's not really what the Machian ideal should be. The Machian ideal should be to recover all the observational predictions of general relativity, but to explain why uh, space-time or that structure of Einstein's takes the form it does. So that that's how, how i think about it so we've rushed on rather ahead so i suppose we should go <laughs> we've back moved on <laughs> about 300 and three well 250 years or so and uh, we still got another 50 years or 100 years from general relativity to, to now but um no i think you're right we should maybe just recap where we've got to um and i think it's you know the bucket experiment in particular i i think is is an interesting one to go over but if we summarize the motivations for Newton or his arguments for why space and time were these fundamental, in his view, objects, elements of reality. As you mentioned at the beginning, time for him, uh, you know, I, th I think the argument's pretty weak, but he was suggesting, well, there's all these processes going on, which seem to be measuring off something common and therefore perhaps there's some almost platonic ideal behind this that um, is being reflected in in, oh. in all these processes. And space, as you say, he has a somewhat um, stronger basis or necessity for, for saying that there is absolute space, because if you want to define what a straight line is, if you want to define inertial motion, for Newton, the way of doing that was to say, well, it's it's moving against this invisible fabric, which... Um, you so beautifully call uh, a kind of a giant block of ice. Um, yeah, in, yeah. But, uh, you know, I think Leibniz had pretty good rejoinders to those arguments. And there's this wonderful debate between um, Leibniz and, and Samuel Clarke, who is always described as a kind of disciple of, of Newton, as if Newton is this messianic figure, which maybe he thought of himself as. He seems quite... Um, but, um, and, and in that debate, I think, you know, Leibniz keeps on, I, I, I find that Clark is on the ropes for most of it. 
uh, and Leibniz has very good arguments about, well, it doesn't, you know, why say that if something is moving against absolute space and in straight lines when we can say that it's relative, its motion is relative to other things. But then Clark's really good argument comes back to the bucket and saying, well, I have this bucket that's um, you know spinning round. Um, there's water in it. As it starts to spin, that water starts to curve. At first, the water is spinning relative to the the walls of the bucket. So you might say, oh well, it's it's caused by the relative motion, as you were saying. Um, but then it reaches a steady state where the bucket is spinning, the water is spinning, and the water and the surface is still curved. And Newton and, and, and Clark say, well, this is what you're moving against is, is the uh, fabric, that fabric of space, that, that ice is, as, as you put it. Um, and that for Newton is quite an effective argument. I think partly because Newton didn't like the idea of action at a distance, which he did admit into his theory. It's, it's in there in the inverse mm. square law of, of gravitational attraction, but he clearly didn't like that. He always, you know, he famously said, I frame no hypotheses for how that works. Um, and one, uh, I, I, I somewhat, I get the impression somewhat that, that Leibniz wasn't too keen on action at a distance either, because the, if he, if he had been happier to introduce that, I feel that the Machian principle would have been um, more obvious to him. And, and then, as you say, hundreds of years later, Mac comes back and says, well, no, yeah, <laughs> It is moving rather. What about all those stars all over the place? All the matter that's in the universe. Maybe that has something to do with the um, f- with that relative motion. Um, and I think we should, you know, mention here that th- this is something that I-, I would say has been quite quite well put to bed by the the work that that you did um, with collaborators on reformulating Newtonian mechanics. So, so as to remove this need to define your motions relative to something that's independent of objects themselves, to to to, to put it all in relative terms. Um, yeah, perhaps you can talk a little bit about about that, as I feel, you know, that, that's a a real win. <laughs> this is Leibniz. I think would be happy with with the, with that result. Yes, uh, well, thank you. Um, I think it is a definite advance, but uh, there is an issue which is uh, occupying me more and more now is that that work that I did, uh, the first breakthrough was with my Italian collaborator, Bruno Bertotti, and then from about 1999, I was working a lot with other people as well, was uh, that... The, the main striking model uh, with Bertotti was for a finite number of particles. Right. So basically, basically, uh, if there were, the way I just uh, describe it is if there were only three particles in the universe, they would form a triangle at any instant. So, um, and then at a later instant, the shape, the size and shape of that triangle, if we allow that there is what, that there's some ruler outside the universe which tells the, the size, which is which is an issue which also needs to be addressed. But let's accept it for the moment. So at a, at a earlier or a later instant, the size of the triangle would the the triangle would be somewhat different. Its shape and size would have changed. So basically, uh, the idea that Bertotti and I developed, which we uh, which I now call best matching, but originally we called it the intrinsic derivative is to suppose that you could just put, lay those two triangles on top of each other and move them relative to each other until you'd changed the the apparent, uh, you'd reduced the apparent change to an absolute minimum. So you can't bring them to exact congruence. You can't lay one exactly on top of the other because they're incongruent, they've changed. But you can bring them so that so you have particle one at one vertex and it will have appeared to have moved a certain distance. So you take that distance and square it and multiply it by the mass of that particle. And you do the same for all of the particles. 
you add up the whole lot and you you take the square root. Well, you can call that the 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 distance between those two particles, th those two triangles. Sorry, and then you can so I call that best matching, and it's related to a very fundamental property in mathematics related to group theory. It is a, a, a it, it is using group theory, and th then you can say that really you should think of there isn't any time at all really. There's just a landscape, a space of all possible triangles in the simplest non-trivial case, and say that really uh, the history of the universe is just a continuous curve in the space of all possible triangles. Mm -hmm. uh, and that's a geodesic, then you have a geodesic principle, and that's essentially what Bertotti and I did. And then you can, uh, so then there isn't really any time. So history is not a, a bright spot of light moving along that, that curve in, 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 in the space of all possible triangles. Um, history is just the, the path itself. The, mm -hmm. it, it, it is just the path. But you can, uh, what we showed is that you can introduce a special way of labeling the points along the path, which... When you do that, you find that the, the, the universe is evolving in accordance with Newton's law. And the simplest one you get is that the energy, the total energy is exactly zero. And also the, the key thing is the angular momentum is exactly zero. So mm -hmm. what, you, what you've done then is make the Newtonian theory much more predictive because you cut out a huge number mm -hmm. of solutions uh, and at the same time, you've met your intuition, uh, to use Poincaré's phrase, uh, a result that would uh, satisfy the mind, the mind of a philosopher, <laughs> as, as Poincaré would put it. So um, I think that is a good result. But the, it is important in that, that you can only do it if there's a finite number of particles. Right. Um, I. Yeah, I, I, I want to dwell on it just a, a little longer, because as you say, I think the fact that it requires the angular momentum to be zero. So, for instance, if we discovered, if we believed we were living in a Newtonian world, let's just suppose that, um, but we found that everything had some, everything seemed to be spinning, like the whole universe seemed to be spinning. There was some measurement we could do which just suggested there was an, a, a non-vanishing angular momentum to everything. That would sort of rule out the theory, <laughs> right? If we if we discover the fixed stars weren't fixed, um, then you know I think Newton's argument would would more or less stand that there's there appears to be some fabric against which everything is moving. The fact that we don't see that, um, you know, if you, if one thinks of this in kind of Bayesian terms, you want to take the theory, you know, the, the theory that, that is more parsimonious in its predictions is, is the one that you want to give preference to. Um, and that is um, this theory that introduces uh, shape, um, uh, best man matching. Uh, and I would also point listeners to, I, I think it's just, this is really well expressed in in your book, the Janus point. But um, particularly people who have who have studied some physics, there's been this kind of tradition where one begins, I guess, at, at um, secondary school and learns Newton's three laws as as three laws, and then there's a reformulation in terms of um, Lagrangian mechanics and uh, Hamiltonian mechanics, where um, you have a kind of richer way of of applying. Um, Newtonian mechanics. And what's really striking about best matching is that it looks exactly the same, right? The form of the equations look exactly the same as, as what you're getting out of um, Hamiltonian mechanics. But you just have to, you have to do the best, best matching first. You have to be able to associate um, each point or, or, as you say, arrange those triangles so there is minimal difference between them and it also only works or only recovers um the same predictions in the case that your angular momentum is is, is zero um so i it when one looks at the equations it's not it, it doesn't feel like you've had to obviously a lot of work's gone in but it doesn't feel contrived is what i, I mean to say it's simple in in many senses um yeah so, if I, 
if I can come in, I think that that's true. There's a very nice thing. So Leibniz has what he calls the principle of the identity of indiscernibles. And in mm. the in the correspondence with Clark, he makes the point, which many, many people have recognized the, the strength of, that he said that if, if position is defined by distance from other bodies, if you move all the bodies <laughs> through through absolute through newton's imagined absolute space or you turn east turn them rotate them and things like that nothing observable will change and therefore you have to say those two situations are exactly the same now it's quite striking that in saying that those situations are exactly the same uh Leibniz was anticipating group theory, the theory of group transformations and and their interpretation. And uh, uh, it, that was brought home to me when I read a paper by Hermann Weyl, a great mathematician, in about 18, uh, 1930, where he said that uh, uh, Leibniz had anticipated the interpretation of group theory there. So group theory is really very fundamental. It's one can almost say the facts of group theory are embodied in us. We uh, just when we walk and change, turn turn around, and things like that, we're actually making group transformations, and we see the effect in what we can see. So, so that's uh, that's fine. I think to you know that that support. That's why it all goes through so smoothly. I would say, although. Conceptually, uh, Leibniz is generally felt to have had the better arguments with Clark. When it came, when push came to shove, he failed because he, uh, when the, the challenge came, how do you define motion when all the bodies are moving relative to each other, uh, whether it's an infinite number or a finite number? And he said, well, then suppose that a large number of bodies or a fixed number of bodies don't change the positions relative to each other then we can <laughs> use them as the reference for defining the motion of the remaining one so that that he he failed there miserably one has to say leibniz and i think that's the the main reason why he he he, he lost ultimately he lost the debate but uh this is this is what we uh, that's the problem we solve with with best matching. So what we're doing, so we're actually using Leibniz's group transformations, which he implicitly assumed 150 years before group theory was developed. So instead of imagining that we're moving one fixed set of bodies through absolute space, we're imagining that we're moving what the, the same bodies, but in a slightly different configuration relative to an earlier one. So, so we've got two, at uh, two instances, we have two configurations which are not the same. And we're using those group transformations not to move one relative to, to different positions in absolute space, but relative to the other one, the the earlier, if you call it the earlier configuration or the or the later configuration. So it's it's moving two things relative to each other. So you would be changing something which is observable. Uh, so if 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 you were God doing this best matching of moving one next to the other, you would see the result and you would see when they're best matched. Yeah. So, and of course so if that gets around the problem. And and if everything is if if the entire universe is 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 revolving, the shape best matches onto itself. So that, that it's it comes back to the identity of indiscernibles, Leibniz's principle, and there's just nothing to to say there. It, it, <laughs> there, yes, there is you can, no. You can well, when you've got those two triangles in the best match position, you can imagine them anywhere in absolute space or moving around yeah. anywhere in absolute space. It will not make one iota of difference to the to the observable facts um and that's called background in the, i mean uh, one of the holy grails of quantum gravity is to achieve what's called background independence well uh, uh, best matching is guaranteed to do that and what um, what you do get out of course is um when you extend it to a large number of particles and obviously you can't do it for uh, an infinite number as you mentioned but you do recreate the angular momentum between sets of particles that are moving so if you if, if you have a kind of 
large configuration of 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 masses and um among those some are rotating around each other sort of like solar systems their angular momentum will be felt and it's the result of the influence of all the other particles creating a kind of fixed geometric background almost um yeah, yeah that's very nice yeah I, if i can come in it, it that's very nice and it's a very wonderful feature of hmm. newtonian theory which i don't think has been recognized at all because um uh, as i explained in the janus point you can have situations where um the particles have a more or less uniform distribution and a random dis uh, directions of their motions but then uh, as it evolves in both directions of Newtonian time, clusters form, and all those clusters uh, can, as you say, have different values of the angular momentum and energy. The only thing is it must all add up to zero, the, 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 the total must be zero. And that's that's really, I think, very satisfying. It, it shows that the universe is holistic. And also, I would say that what we regard as local laws of nature are emergent. So the whole universe satisfies what is called constrained Hamiltonian dynamics. That's because the energy and the angular momentum are exactly zero. That's what's called constrained Hamiltonian dynamics. So the universe as a one single entity is, is, is constrained. But then when these subsystems form, they then satisfy Hamiltonian dynamics because the energy and the angular momentum in each of them can have arbitrary values subject to that very important proviso that the total is is zero it's quite remarkable so, so that, yeah so you know, just to finish so that the local laws of nature are emergent out of a holistic law of the whole universe yeah yeah it, it explains also something that that others may have been wondered about which is why is the inertial mass the same as the gravitational mass or it at least gives a very strong feeling for why that is and because a, a priori there's no reason why the attraction between uh, you know the, the gravitational attraction between two masses should be the same number um you know the same property as the um the inertial mass, right? They, they're, they're performing quite different functions. Um, whereas that just fits very nicely within this framework. There's, there's just one kind of mass and the... <laughs> yeah, I don't... Well, it is, it is nice, but I wouldn't say it's necessary. I'd say it's, it's, it's agreeable, but not necessary. And of course, you do have electromagnetic interactions. Right. Yeah. Which which are are different i would say it's 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 an agreeable feature but it's it it, it i mean clearly it, it needn't have been that way i think mm. you, can do, you can do best matching under all circumstances mm -hmm. i want to move on and talk to something um slightly different and get to the louisville theorem which was for me one of the most remarkable chapters in your book the the Janus point where um, you start thinking about the direction of time and how that's related to, maybe we need to wind back a little bit and, and first talk about a particular way that you can characterize shapes. So we've talked about best matching. Um, you have this notion complexity, um, which has a really interesting kind of status within um relationships to, to the gravitational p potential um yeah perhaps talk us through what is complexity what in fact what got you started thinking about complexity in in the first place um, oh well that's that that's that's very well first of all this absolutely definitely goes back to leibniz i read leibniz so a very nice collection of Leibniz's philosophical papers in 1977. And I was very 
impressed by the fact Leibniz you can what you get from that is is that Leibniz says it's a very simple obvious fact that if there were no variety in the world that there just wouldn't be any science we wouldn't know we would we were talking we couldn't do anything without variety that is the sort of the epistemic foundation of everything of, of science of existence of, of everything it's variety and and then Leibniz believed as a metaphysical principle in in perfection that, mm. that god would strive to make things as perfect as possible so he are uh, you you can interpret leibniz as saying um well one way of interpreting what he says is that the universe is striving to become ever more perfect and I, but actually in the monadology he says that it that we are in a universe which is more varied than any other well that's what i believed for quite a long time and developed that idea uh, with Lee Smolin. But after about 10 years, I began to feel that the way that Lee had produced a very interesting mathematical way of, of realizing Leibniz's idea was actually not going to get really much further. Um, but I always had at the back of my mind something uh, that would characterize variety. Right. And, um, through meeting specialists in the Newtonian n-body problem, there's a relatively small number of very top-class mathematicians who work on, on developing Newton's theory of, of gravity. It's, I mean, cosmologists are using, New, I mean, lots of people are using Newtonian gravity all the time, but just a small number of them, as I say, perhaps 20 or 30, uh, really concentrate on really the fundamental mathematics that really is is the, the the guts of the theory. And that's very, very interesting. Very few people know about it. Now, what... Uh, so all of this is to do with the fact um, that the Kant... It's ridiculous to assume that there's a ruler outside the universe. There's a problem of, of what do you mean by changing the size of the universe overall. And in fact, Poincaré, the great French mathematician, says, imagines that everything in the universe changes overnight, uh, gets a thousand times greater. But he mm. says it's ridiculous. Mm. You, you, within the universe, you wouldn't notice anything. It's an assumption. You, really, when, when you think that way, you're assuming that there's a ruler outside the universe. So, so there can't be a ruler outside the universe. So... Um, now, this is where group theory comes in uh, also very, very fundamentally, because the Newton gravitational potential. So from the Newton gravitational potential, which is a one upon R potential, you get the famous inverse square law, which is one upon R squared. But the Newton potential, which is really, I suppose you could call it the motor of Newton's theory of gravity, be, because it's one upon so it's it it depends upon the separations between the particles which means that if you move all the particles or you rotate them all that's doing a leibnizian move mm -hmm. it doesn't change the value mm -hmm. of the newton potential however if you change the scale you, if you enlarge all the separations, the Newton potential goes down in value. So the Newton potential is not invariant under dilatations. It's not scale invariant. But you can change it to something which the people who work on Newton's theory at this really fundamental level call the shape potential or the normalized Newton potential, and they, 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 and it is the the Newton potential made scale invariant. You multiply it by what's called the root mean square length. So the root mean square length. So you've got these separations between the particles. You you square all of those separations. You multiply. So so you've got r one two between particle one and particle mm -hmm. two. You square that. You multiply by the mass of particle one and the mass of particle two. Uh, and then you add that up for all the particles, and then you take the square root. And that's the root mean square length. And it change that changes with the length. So now if you multiply the Newton potential by the root mean square length, you've got 
the two factors, uh, one of them increases if you increase the, the length and the other decreases. Mm. So yeah. the effect is cancelled out. So if you just you moved take... everything further apart, there'd be no difference. That's the scale invariance. So that's the scale invariance, yes. And so you, you've achieved something. Um, now... What is very interesting, so uh, and this is sort of really only fully dawned on me, and hadn't even fully dawned on me when I wrote the Janus point or Janus point. <laughs> you can choose your pronunciation. <laughs> is that the the Newton potential? So there's there's actually two fundamental. If you if you Talk to if you talk to mathematicians about points distributed in Euclidean space, forget that they have mass, they're just points in Euclidean space. There's two obvious lengths associated with the, that distribution. One of them is what I've already described, the root mean square length. The other one is what is called the mean harmonic length. Hmm. Now, very interestingly, the mean harmonic length is the inverse of the Newton potential. Mm. And so that shape potential or the complexity, as we call it, is the ratio of those two things. Now, that that's that for me, the complexity is it, I would say for me, it's absolutely fascinating quantity. So, first of all, um, if you it's a measure of variety or of complexity, that's why we call it complexity, because if you've got, say, 20 particles and you move two or three of them close to each other or you even bring them to coincidence the root mean square length hardly changes mm. but the the mean harmonic length gets much much smaller because it's the inverse of the newton potential so the newton potential gets huge if you bring particles close to each other and so what that means is that the shape potential is very is a very sensitive measure of clustering or variety and that's it was when i was beginning to get aware, aware of that i was talking to a, a, one of these newtonian specialists at the observatory in paris about that i think it was 2011 and saying could this shape potential be a good measure of variety and uh, and that was key uh, to to get that insight. Uh, so that's one thing. But then the other thing is that it's it's you can call it it's a it's a dimensionless radius of this distribution of particles because the mean harmonic length is more or less the average of the large separations, and the mean harmonic length is the average of the short separations. Now, when you measure a, an interval, a longish interval, you take a short ruler to measure it. Mm. So if you want to say, how would beings, observers within uh, such mm. a universe defined by these points, how would they measure its size? Well, they would see how many times the mean harmonic length goes into the root mean square length. And they would call that the radius of their universe. Hmm. So and that yeah, yeah. and that and that has a minimum value when the when the universe is more u, is more uniform than any other distribution that it can have that quantity has its minimum and then as it clusters it just goes on getting bigger and bigger yeah yeah and that then that then led to the paper that my Two collaborators, Tim Koslowski and Flavio Mercati, uh, were able to publish in 2014, about two years after I'd had that discussion at the observatory in Paris, where we find an alternative explanation of the arrow of time, which is nothing whatever to do with entropy. So mm. uh, ever since the discovery of thermodynamics, it was thought that uh the universe must end in, in a heat death where all differences are evened out. And um, a, 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 and things would come to an end. And then uh, Clausius developed the notion of entropy and said that, uh, on uh, a, a, which has since become 
characterized as a measure of disorder. And uh, Clausius then, in 1865, he coined the expression entropy, and he, he, he then very proudly formulated two laws of the universe. The energy of the universe is constant. The entropy of the universe tends to a maximum. Mm -hmm. So ever since then, particularly since a famous debate between Boltzmann and Zermelo uh, the, in 1895-96 period, uh, it's been assumed that entropy is what gives rise to the direction of time, that we experience a direction, in, 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 and, and in the universe, uh, that's de defined by an increase in entropy. Uh, and moreover, it's a statistical effect. It's not to be found, if you look at the laws of nature, it's not to be found in, in a single solution. It's in what's called the way the Gibbs distribution evolves in accordance with Liouville's theorem. It spreads out all over the place in accordance with Liouville's theorem. Um, so that's the, the, the way that people do it. But uh, uh, so it's, as I say, the key thing is the increase of entropy is not in an individual solution. Now, in the Newtonian end body problem, there's a, if the energy is non-negative, which it jolly well better be if the universe is machian, uh, there's always a special point on the timeline of the universe that I call the Janus point or Janus point, because at it in Newtonian terms, the size of the universe is minimal at this point. In the infinite mm. past, it's infinitely great. It decreases monotonically in general to a finite value and then increases again. But the much more significant thing for people inside that universe who can only see how it changes is that at the Janus point, the distribution is more uniform around, at least around the Janus point, the, the distribution is more uniform than anywhere else. And in both directions away from it, it becomes more clustered and the complexity increases. And the key thing is that happens in every single solution. So this completely transforms the discussion of the origin of the arrow of time. Uh, and moreover, as that complexity increases in both directions away from the Janus point, these clusters that we've already talked about form, and these clusters all have a birth and a death, and their births and deaths, the arrows of the birth from the birth to the death, they all point in the same way, and they all point in the same direction as the increasing complexity. So the increasing complexity is the master arrow of time and reflects the fact that these uh, subsystems are forming. Now, uh, when, does, when does thermodynamics hold? Now, Einstein said that thermodynamics was the only physical theory of universal content of which I am convinced mm. that within the proper domain of applicability of its basic concepts will never be overthrown. But people just forget about that caveat. What are the conditions under which thermodynamics hold? Well, thermodynamics came out of the study of steam engines. Mm. Steam engines stop if the, if the steam escapes from the cylinder. So basically, you've got to have a system in a box for things like the increase of entropy. And if you then look at the, the, the atomistic explanation that was developed to explain the, the laws of thermodynamics, in particular, the second law of thermodynamics, the increase of entropy, first really seriously by Clausius, then followed by Maxwell, who, who proposed his uh, the Maxwell distribution of velocities or, or, or so forth, and then Boltzmann and then, and then Gibbs. They all assume a system in a box. So you have yeah. molecules that bounce off each other, but critically, they bounce elastically off the walls of a box, which prevents them escaping. That's right. This isn't just a conceptual box. This is a real box, right? It's not. Well, mathematically, it, well, first of all, in, in the laboratory, it, it's a physical box. That's where all of these things were tested. I mean, the the uh, I mean, Maxwell actually did famous tests on viscosity uh, in a box. Um, mm. And in fact, rediscovered something that had boil and uh, and 
uh, and uh, Hook, Robert Hook had discovered 200 years earlier that if you have a pendulum in a in a box and you evacuate the gas in the box, the period of the pendulum doesn't change, doesn't until you until you get down to incredibly rarefied state in the gas. And that was Maxwell couldn't believe that that was that that comes out of the mathematics, out of statistical mechanics. Amazingly, it's an extraordinary result, which Maxwell couldn't believe. He thought it disproved the atomistic theory, Hmm. Uh, but his mathematics. And then he then he checked. Then he did an experiment with his wife, a famous experiment with his wife and, and, and confirmed that that was the case. But it had actually been done and forgotten uh sort of 200 years earlier by by Boyle and, and Robert Hooke um so this the, the role of the box is critical mm. and and without it and in mathematical terms it says that you've got a dynamical system whose solutions are only exploring a phase space of bounded Liouville measure mm. So you've got two completely different situations, one where the Liouville measure is bounded and the other where it is unbounded. And in the Newtonian n-body problem, it's unbounded. And I suspect that it's also unbounded for the universe at the moment. The universe, is its expansion seem, is, is accelerating according to all the observations. Right. And and. and- and just to clarify, I think there's a there's a few things we should walk back over here because this is just really fascinating. We've 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 rushed through this incredibly interesting notion complexity, or not rushed through, but um, there's so much to unpack there. And from it, we get the the arrow of time and um, discussing problems with with entropy. But just on this boundedness, um, if you have everything in a box, there's just a finite number of states that you can be in. If your universe is expanding, not bounded um, number of states, and that changes many things. I want to come back as well to the traditional um, explanations of of the arrow of time, which, as you hinted, were all entropy based. And one of the unsatisfactory features of those explanations is you only get the arrow of time by adding this this pass hypothesis, as David Albert calls it. You have yeah. symmetric laws of physics, and what changes things is this this kind of boundary condition, the way that things were at the the start of the universe. It seems somewhat ad hoc, and it would be nice to be able to say why that holds, or come up with a, an alternative explanation. And as you say, from the end body problem, the particles can be set down in any configuration. And they will pass through this under their gravitational interac- um, interactions. They will pass through this minimal point. And furthermore, and this is, I think, where the Louisville's theorem comes in, and, and the complexity comes in. As you move away from that point, that that minimal point is is going to have minimal complexity. And as you move away from that, your your complexity increases. And if I understand correctly, it's it's simply because. Your complexity is made of of this this term which describes the overall scale and this term which describes the shape. And if everything is moving apart from where it was previously, I don't want to say the universe is getting bigger, but it's it's expanding from where it was. Louisville's theorem says, you know, phase space is kind of a a dense fluid. Its volume is preserved as you move through it. So so the volume of phase space, I, I want to say, of the of that configuration of an any configuration has to stay the same as it as it evolves. The separations are going to be getting larger because everything's expanding. To compensate for that, the other component of the complexity has to change as well. And the way that changes, and the way that changes is is it's forced to generate more structure. Perhaps you can read that back in a in a, in a well. In a more... I would say there are there are. One has to. I would say one has to distinguish between what one could call the extended representation. So you can, you can have a representation in which um, you imagine there is an absolute space with an absolute scale, and you mm-hmm. represent it in that. And then you distinguish between the variables that describe your system in that situation with what are called the physical variables, where you 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 get rid of. The extra descript the the ec- extra descriptors, if you like, that mm. Newton introduced. So what you can do is you can take a Newtonian solution and then you can throw away all the suspect extra structure that Newton introduced, 
And that will actually just leave you with a succession of shapes. Yeah. And that's really where the truth resides. <laughs> and, and basically the Newtonian solutions, um, certainly if the energy is, is not negative, and the most interesting case is when the energy and the angular momentum are both exactly zero, which is exactly what you do expect in, in a Leibniz in Machian situation, then, then that just has this behavior that there's always a tendency to increase. There's a, the, you, you can think of, the complexity is like the the altitude in a landscape, the the height above sea level in a, in a landscape, and 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 there are there are infinitely high peaks in this landscape where the complexity becomes infinite. So the there will be a, a Janus point somewhere there where the Newtonian size is minimal, but it's it's actually quite difficult to spot where it is in 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 shape space. But you can spot it. My mm. collaborator. Con Koslovsky showed a precise mathematical condition where the Janus point is in shape space. But as you go away from it, instead of following a geodesic, which is the simplest law you would have, the curve in both directions from the Janus point is just always, it will go back a bit, but it will, it's always trying to climb up these peaks of the complexity. So, uh, and even if it will go back a bit, it will then keep on turn around and it, it will it will strive to go up and this is what i call gravity's creative core so mm. my interpretation of newton's theory it, it's nothing whatever about it's not really about what people like blake the the, the poet and artist so hated of sort of cogwheels turning and, and desperately boring and, and dead really it's a theory of creation it's a theory of creation of order out of disorder, uh, and um, that's the, the 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 core of the matter. So I, I recently posted a, a paper on the archive, Gravity's Creative Core, pointing out this 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 fact, uh, and and I think it's been it's just been missed that that's what's going on i mean this is again the accidental way <laughs> that that uh, science develops um I th it is yeah it, it, it's a stunning contrast to what we get from the entropic picture where everything is going to end in this uh yeah featureless soup maybe where and it comes down to the complexity, and I, I, I want to re-emphasize again that you can you can arrive at the complexity from two different routes. One is, as you said, just thinking purely mathematically about what is a really good way of characterizing clustering and 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 variety. Um, what is something that is is minimized when everything is very homogeneously uh, placed um, versus something that's maximized, where you have very interesting, you know, lots of clustered reason, regions. Um, but it also, the complexity also emerges or, or just matches the um, Newtonian gravitational potential, which is why you say Newtonian gravity seems to be configured to be the thing that will um, produce, or sorry, part of the complexity matches that, it seems to be configured to be the, the thing that will produce maximal shape variety. Um, and that yes. I, I could let, let me just come in though, because one caveat must be made is uh, what it does is it will create structure. Uh, in particular, it will create pairs of particles, Kepler pairs, which go round each other and become rods, clocks, and compasses all in one, tremendously well uh, synchronized with each other. Uh, but in fact, for a fixed number of particles, in the end, nothing much more will happen. The, the system gets into what's called limit cycles. So although it's not heat death, the, the clocks get ever more accurate, but they, 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 they don't go beyond being clocks. Now, somehow or other, this is, this is intimately, I think, related to the problem of infinity. And it's a thing about which I'm thinking a great deal at the moment. Um, so you can, uh, it's not unrelated to the idea of, of, of a, 
of a multiverse or a many uh, the, the 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 sort of the many worlds interpretation of quantum mechanics, but not in quantum mechanical terms. So um, you could always say for a given num value of n, the number of particles, you would have a different different solutions, different histories of universes for, for different numbers of particles. Now, what is interesting is when you see how this evolution happens, much the same thing happens if you've got starting just with three particles, or if you have an, an even arbitrarily large number of particles. So basically, the same sort of structure happens and possibly outrageous. Now, I mean, I think infinity is one of the great, is probably the greatest mystery of all in, 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 in science. And, and, and how we really grapple with it, I don't know. But I mean, it, it I think it could just be that you could have Newtonian solutions with, say, n equal to a trillion, where there are regions within it which look like very similar to regions in another solution where you've got a trillion times a trillion particles. There are hints, I think, from that already in, in the, the studies that have been done by the chap with whom I'm collaborating. Uh, so this would I mean even just might I mean this is very hugely sort of conjectural but I don't think it's any stranger than the many worlds interpretation of quantum mechanics there might even be a sort of an afterlife in which our discussion here is going on in a in a universe with many more sort of units in it, many more particles within it. It's at least mathematically conceivable, I think. Um, but I, I really want to, I, I throw that, you can almost call it an outrageous suggestion, out as a, a way to highlight how the, how, what a huge, <laughs> literally a huge problem infinity is. Uh, it, it, it's it's really a very very big problem uh, understanding what the implications of infinity are. So all, all I would say with some degree of confidence is that the arrow of time does not have to be explained by adding on to known known laws of nature a very special condition in the past for which there is no obvious reason it should be there. Um, so that, that I think, Jed, the fact that we've changed the discussion about the origin of the arrow of time, I think that's a solid result. I feel pretty confident about that. But what its long term implications are, I wouldn't like to say. So I guess we don't know what it will mean for the. I mean, one of the questions I have is, is do you think there will be consciousness at the end of the universe? And it's almost a corollary of, of will this interesting complexity that seems to be producing things you know really rich structures like ourselves and and the world that we see around us will the world continue to have that kind of richness and i guess the answer is hard to speculate um well it's hard to speculate. i mean i think to the extent that the the work that i've done with the newtonian end body problem is any guide uh it, it's pointing in the direction of it's something that that would be realized only at infinity. That, that, mm. that the, I mean, you can see this already if you just start with the Newtonian three-body problem, which is the first non-trivial problem. Uh, you uh, you get something of some interest, but already when you get, you see, when you, I, I've been in collaborating with, with someone in California who's very good at numerical work, and on his laptop, he's, he started with 50 particles near the, uh, the Janus point, and after a while, he devolved it, and he'd got 11 Kepler pairs, two particle pairs of mm. particles going around each other, forming ever better clocks, rods, and compasses all in one. And in addition, he'd got three particles, which had formed a pretty stable pair. So mm. this was pretty interesting structure that had been formed. Mm. 
uh, that's much more interesting than can happen with the three-body problem, because in the three-body problem, two particles will form a Kepler pair, and, and the other particle as a singleton will go off in the opposite mm. direction to it. Uh, so you see the the you can immediately see going from three particles to 50, the enrichment. So I would say just increase the number of particles um, in, in sort of scientific term is increase the, 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 the possible degrees of freedom and you'll just get ever richer situations. And I think that's, I suspect that may be all that one can say. I'm told by my collaborator, Koslovsky, that in quantum field theory, Basically, they're always dealing with a finite number of particles. But if the theory is consistent for an arbitrary large number of particles, then then that, that theory is OK. So I suspect that at the moment, physics can't do any better than that. But I'm not an expert in quantum field theory, so I'm a bit relying on my collaborator when I say that. But so, so as I say, this has all come since I finished writing the Janus point. And in, in that book towards the end of chapter 18, I actually conjecture that complexity is does not just determine the direction of time that we experience, but is time itself. Mm. And that's all very interesting. And um, uh, there's there's at least two talks of mine on podcasts where I'm, I'm talking about all the, the fascinating things that, that go with that. Um, I was curious as well. Have you tried? Have you um, measured the? So I've just done something with my. Oops, <laughs> just did something. Can you hear me? Okay, I can hear you. Yes, yes. Um, have you tried to measure the complexity of? So, so one way of looking at things is it's like you say to run simulations and see what emerges. But I'm curious if you if you've used complexity as a measure of pre-existing things. And one idea came that came to my mind was, you know. Could we look at the complexity of something like a, a neural network and artificial intelligence? Um, you know, perhaps the the weights between neurons or your masses, or or something like this, or the complexity of uh, other forms of information, much as as entropy is applied um, as a a measure of information. I think many people find that somewhat unsatisfying in that the maximal you know capacity of a channel or maximal information seems to be just completely random which which jars with our intuitions whether whereas complexity seems like a better measure of those sort of things um and if we have a universe where we know the complexity needs to increase would that suggest that we again get these very interesting structures if we can say ah oh, yes this structure the human mind is is the most complex thing much more complex than uh, I, I what I would I think of this is more just a question of more I would at the moment I'm thinking it's a question just of distributions of points in Euclidean space now mm. now that is it's a sort of minimal model of a neural network at a given instant because all right. the particles are connected to each other uh, and there's they're, they're, they're mutually consistent all these separations because there's essentially n squared separations if they're n particles but you only need three n minus seven numbers to define the shape so then i would say that at a given value of the complexity the will necessarily that the will be uh, localized regions, which are particularly interesting structures, and I would liken them, perhaps, shall we say, to the human brain and and the feeling of of, of some sort of uh, awareness and and consciousness. I, I mean, this would be a, a, a theory of psycho mathematical parallelism. But I see we're nearing the end, and it's also half past six. I don't know whether you've got to go. We could continue this another day if you like, but. I, I I think um, probably however many hours we have will never be enough to unravel the mysteries of the universe. No, <laughs> so that's for sure. Yes, we may have to call it here, but I would be delighted to um, to talk to you again. Um, uh, but I think we have enough material to to fill minds as it is. Yes. All right. Okay. Uh, I think probably it is just now six thirty, and you said you needed to probably to be stopping about now. That's right. I have some. I, I, have I some think Lego. struggling with infinity is an appropriate place to stop. <laughs> yes. Uh, 
well this has just been a wonderful conversation and as i said i i there's so much more i think we we, we could talk about but uh i just wanted to thank you for you know you these are problems you've worked with or on for for decades and uh i think absolutely fascinating leibniz mac would be happy that you are carrying forward the the torch <laughs> for uh <laughs> I did, yes well the, the the intuitions for them are strong that that you can say yes it's been a real pleasure thank you so much Julian. all right pleasure okay